Welcome to worship at St. Timothy Lutheran Church. I have a question for you today. What is it that you want to do? I mean, what is it that you really want to do? When you get in touch with the deep love, the deep desires of your life, what is it that you want to do that will, that will bless the world, that will show some great love, or make something or somebody else better, more alive, more free, more fair, more just. When we get in touch with those deep desires, the ones that operate beneath the surface of daily life, it is then that we get in touch with what God's Spirit is doing and saying in us and what God's Spirit wants to do through us through each one of us. For God has a deep purpose for and in and through our lives. And we're, we will be thinking about that in today's readings and in the sermon. And we hope that through worshiping with us today, you will both know God's love more fully, more thoroughly, and also know what God in love wants to do through you. So welcome once again to worship. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God full of compassion and mercy, abounding in steadfast love. Amen. Trusting God's promise of forgiveness, let us confess our sin against God and one another. Eternal God, our Creator, in you we live and move and have our being. Look upon us, your children, the work of your hands. Forgive us all our offenses and cleanse us from proud thoughts and empty desires. By your grace, draw us near to you, our refuge and our strength. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And hear this good news. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit given to us. And in the mercy of Almighty God, Christ died for us while we still were sinners. And for his sake, God forgives you all your sins. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Hey friends, it's time for the children's sermon. Back in Jesus' time, it was a little harder to know what was going on around you, right? You didn't have the internet or TV or a phone that could take pictures or videos. News just didn't travel as far. They didn't even have newspapers, which you know we don't use a lot of these days, but they didn't have any of those things. And so people would hear stories and kind of figure out what was going on and make best guesses. And that happened with Jesus, too. People started to hear stories about Jesus. And they would try to figure out who this guy was, and they didn't have pictures, they didn't see him on the news, they just heard these stories about Jesus going from town to town and doing these amazing things. And so they started to think, hmm, I wonder who this Jesus could be. And they came up with a, a lot of names or even professions that this Jesus uh, might be doing. And here are some of the things that people came up with when they just heard little snippets of his story. Jesus would go around and heal people. And so some people must have thought, oh, he must be like a doctor or a physician. And well, that's sort of true. Jesus is kind of like a doctor in that he makes us feel better like doctors do, but he's not a medical professional, I guess you could say. I don't think Jesus 
went to medical school. People also used to think, oh, that Jesus, he talks about the kingdom of God a lot. Maybe he's a king. Well, not really. Jesus is a king in a different way. The kingdom of God is like no earthly kingdom. It's kind of like a little slice of heaven here on earth. People thought, huh, that Jesus sure likes to teach. Maybe he's a teacher. But Jesus didn't have a classroom with a bunch of desks and students. The whole world was Jesus' classroom, and he was here to teach everyone, not just at a school. So that's not quite it either. In our gospel reading for today, we hear that some people think that he's a prophet, an Old Testament prophet who's, who's come back to life, perhaps the prophet Elijah, who did great and wondrous things. Well, Jesus is a prophet. He would tell people truths, sometimes hard truths about their lives and that they should treat people better, but that's not quite it either. Jesus is more than that. In our gospel story for today, people said, well, maybe he's John the Baptist. Here's John the Baptist in his river baptizing people. You know, Jesus was a little like John the Baptist. He liked to walk around in the wilderness and proclaim things for people to hear. But you know what? Jesus was also much more than that. It turns out that Jesus is all of these things and more. Jesus is a physician, a healer. Jesus is a teacher. Jesus is a king. Jesus is a prophet. Jesus is like John the Baptist. But Jesus is also our Lord and our Savior and our friend and the perfect example of God's love. Jesus isn't just any one thing, like you and I might be. I'm a pastor, but Jesus is many things. And that's what I want you guys to know today. Jesus isn't any one thing, but so much more. Amen. The first reading is from Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. Let us give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. For in our union with Christ, he has blessed us by giving us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly world. Even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ, so that we would be holy and without fault before him. Because of his love, God had already decided that through Jesus Christ, he would make us his children. This was his pleasure and purpose. Let us praise God for his glorious grace, for the free gift he gave us in his dear Son. For by the blood of Christ we are set free, that is, our sins are forgiven. How great is the grace of God, which he gave to us in such large measure. In all his wisdom and insight, God did what he had purposed and made known to us the secret plan he had already decided to complete by means of Christ. This plan, which God will complete when the time is right, is to bring all creation together, everything in earth and in heaven, with Christ as head. All things are done according to God's plan and decision, and God chose us to be his own people in union with Christ because of his own purpose, based on what he had decided from the very beginning. Let us then, who were the first to hope in Christ, praise God's glory. And you also became God's people when you heard the true message, that good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and God put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. The Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people, and this assures us that God will complete freedom to those who are his. Let us praise his glory. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to the sixth chapter of Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. 
Now King Herod heard all about this because Jesus' reputation had spread everywhere. Some people were saying John the Baptist has come back to life. That is why he has the power to perform miracles. Others, however, said he is Elijah. Others said he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. When Herod heard it, he said, he is John the Baptist. I had his head cut off, but he has come back to life. Herod himself had ordered John's arrest, and he had him tied up and put in prison. Herod did this because of Herodias, whom he had married, even though she was the wife of his brother Philip. John the Baptist kept telling Herod, it isn't right for you to marry your brother's wife. So Herodias held a judge against a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she could not because of Herod. Herod was afraid of John because he knew that John was a good and holy man, and so he kept him safe. He liked to listen to him even though he became greatly disturbed every time he heard him. Finally, Herodias got her chance. It was on Herod's birthday when he gave a feast for all the top government officials, the military chiefs, and the leading citizens of Galilee. The daughter of Herodias came in and danced and pleased Herod and his guests. So the king said to the girl, What would you like to have? I will give you anything you want. With many vows, he said to her, I swear I will give you anything you ask for, even as much as half my kingdom. So the girl went out and asked her mother, What shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. The girl hurried back at once to the king and demanded, I want you to give me here and now the head of John the Baptist on a plate. This made the king very sad, but he could not refuse her because of the vows he had made in front of all his guests. So he sent off a guard at once with orders to bring John's head. The guard left, went to the prison, and cut John's head off. And then he brought it back on a plate and gave it to the girl who gave it to her mother. When John's disciples heard this, they came and got his body and buried it. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, let us hear the voice of your Spirit deep in our hearts, that hearing you we may follow the call of Christ and serve the purpose of your kingdom, the purpose you have appointed for each of us in our time and in our place, and this for the sake of the love of our Lord Jesus. Amen. Some things, some things become clear only at the end. That's the way it is for most of us, and certainly for me, as I approach my retirement from parish ministry. One of those things that becomes clear or ever more clear is that our lives aren't about us. Our lives are, are about something, something wonderful that seeks to live through us. And I quickly add that it's, it's not really something, but someone who seeks to live through us so that our lives might be vehicles for something greater, so that our lives might become sacraments of the spirit of life, of the spirit who is life and who gives life, which is to say, the spirit of God, who is love. We have inklings of this from time to time. There are even moments of clarity when God's spirit bubbles up maybe at odd or an unexpected moment, bubbles up from deep within us so that we, we know, oh, this is what my life is for. And this awareness can come most any time, but that awareness is, is most likely to come in moments of, of great love or maybe great sorrow. Moments such as when we're caring for the needs of a precious child, or blessing a broken heart, or giving a gift that our heart just aches to give. 
I love the clarity I, I had about this in the years when I worked as a journalist. I wrote stories about hunger and refugees traveling to some of the most troubled places, most troubled countries on the planet. Surrounded by frightened and famished faces of the starving, you didn't ask and you didn't wonder what life was about. You didn't imagine that life's purpose had much to do with satisfying your own desires or pleasing yourself. You knew. You knew that ultimately life was about stopping the abomination of human suffering that screamed at you every single day. There's a mo movie, rather, a, a movie that I often recall in moments when I'm thinking about me and you and thinking about what it means for us to follow the call of Christ. The scene in this movie, it, it occurs near the end of Schindler's List. The setting is Germany, near the end of World War II. Oskar Schindler is a, is a German industrialist with a very checkered past, and he is saying goodbye to Jews whom he had saved. They worked in his factory and he had saved them from Nazi death camps. He had lied and cheated and deceived the Nazi military leaders, insisting that his workers were absolutely essential to Germany's interests as they worked in this factory that in reality was producing absolutely nothing for the German war effort. And at the end, as the war was drawing to a close, the Jews he had saved thanked and blessed him. They gave him a ring, a ring that had an inscription from the Talmud, which is a commentary on Hebrew scripture. And the verse said, whoever saves one life saves the world entire. Schindler receives the ring, not knowing really what to say. But soon afterward, he breaks down. He weeps without an ability to control himself because, in his words, I could have done more. He looks at the car which will soon take him away, he hopes, to safety, and he asks, why did I keep the car? Why didn't I sell it? It could have been sold and the money used to ransom ten more lives. He looks at an old ring on his finger and a gold pin on his lapel and say, these two, he says, these two could have been sold to save two or three more lives. For he realizes life, his life, it's not about him. It's about giving life, caring for life, giving himself away for a purpose that far transcended his wants, his desires, or comforts. The spirit of life, which is to say the spirit of God, the spirit of that great love, had stirred him and moved him to care for the lives of others with great courage at the risk of his own life. And at the end, he sees how much more fully that life, that life of God, that love could have lived so much more through his life. I think of Schindler and myself and you when I read this somewhat strange story about the execution of John the Baptist. And I think of all of us because John the Baptist also knew that life was not about fulfilling his desires. 
He did not seek his happiness in ambition, wealth, or the approval of others. Unlike in our postmodern society, John did not live the illusion that there, there really is only my truth and your truth and somebody else's truth. He knew there was a greater truth, a truth that did not and would not allow him to walk the path of least resistance. John understood that his life, our lives, are part of a great story, the story of God redeeming the world from rot and decay. God was and is drawing the world into a unity of love and justice, Jesus called the kingdom of God. And that work, that kingdom, continues throughout all of history and continues now through the spirit of Christ working in us and in the world. And John, in his time, played his part in this great story, testifying to God's justice, preparing for the arrival of Christ on earth, he gave himself to God's purpose for him until it cost him his life. John's story is, is not a success story. The cavalry did not arrive at the 11th hour to deliver him from King Herod, who had him executed to avoid being embarrassed in front of his influential friends. So it is. There's never a guarantee that when you do the right thing, you're going to be rewarded. It may cost you more. Those who take a stand for God's justice and mercy, like John the Baptist, often end up with more trouble, not less. And John, like Oscar Schindler, moves me to ask a question of myself and of you. What is our part in God's big story? To what purpose, however seemingly great or small, to what purpose are we willing to surrender ourselves that someone else might be more alive, blessed, and free? And more importantly, what now? We can't undo the past. So, what now for this congregation? And what now, I ask for me, as I come upon retirement from parish ministry and look ahead to what's next? Is there something we truly want to do to give of ourselves, to become something more in order to serve the kingdom of our Lord Jesus? Sometimes, on gloomy days, when my mood is a little dark, I ask myself if I have ever done, have I ever done one thing, just one, that has not been tainted by my own ego or self-interest? Has there ever been one pure act of love one moment of truly giving myself to God for the sake of God's living and loving kingdom? Has there been a moment when I took a serious risk that cost me something and stood for something because I knew that this was what God's Spirit was urging me to do? The great reformer Martin Luther would answer my question. And he would say, David, of course not. Everything, everything is tainted by our sin and self-interest. Even our best works are like filthy rags. Well, to be perfectly frank, I think Luther was wrong about that, at least that last part. Because the Spirit who was in Jesus and is in us sometimes shines so brilliantly 
that we see and feel the glory of God alight in acts of great love, in our own acts, and in the acts of others. And seeing this glory shining so brilliantly, it is then that we truly know the light and love who longs to live through us. It is then that we know that to become expressions, sacraments of this light and love, this is what our lives are about. Amen. We come before the triune God, offering ourselves, our needs, and all we are in prayer. Let us pray. Loving God, you welcome your people into one family as you gather all things into yourself that all may be one in your loving unity. Shower your grace upon your beloved church, lavish your wisdom upon us, and redeem us from our faults. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Blessed Creator, your love is steadfast and unending. You tend to all creation, to the smallest of seeds, the mightiest of trees. Spring up green, green growth from the earth. Nourish all things, fruit and grain and other crops. Bless the work of farmers and laborers and all upon whom we depend for the food we share. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Compassionate Lord, you hear the cries of those oppressed. Turn the ears of those who are in power, that they too may hear those voices of those in need, and listen also to the prophets of your love and justice, that they may do your holy will. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Almighty One, you are the strength of those who fail. You come near and strengthen the arms of those who endure great difficulties. Comfort all survivors of violence and injustice Guard the refugee and the immigrant. Protect all who are victims of prejudice and discrimination. And move us to dedicate our lives to the justice of your kingdom. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. 
God of love, we pray for all in need, especially this day Bob Borg, Larry Pfeiffer, and Joni Berkeley. Comfort them in their distress, strengthen them in body and soul, that they may come to the fullness of all you intend for them, shining with your love, your grace, and your strength. We pray also for this holy house and for all who worship here. May we indeed be blessings to each other and to those who serve us both in this church and in all society. May we together praise your holy name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We thank you, O Lord, for the saints, the martyrs, the prophets, the faithful of every time and place, and especially those loving faithful ones who have blessed us. May we in our time live as your faithful disciples, knowing your truth, surrendering to your will, that we in our time may be united with them in your kingdom of light, giving praise to you, praising your great glory now and forever. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We lift all our prayers to you, O God, trusting always in your abiding grace. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks 
and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy. Almighty and merciful God, you are most holy and great is the majesty of your glory. You so love the world that you gave your only Son, that everyone who believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give you thanks for his coming into the world to fulfill for us your holy will and to accomplish all things for our salvation. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his salutary command, his life-giving passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, and these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, may be formed to live as your holy people and be given our inheritance with all your saints. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory in your holy church, both now and forever. Amen. Gathered into one by the Holy Spirit, let us pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The risen Christ invites us to this table. Come, eat, and be satisfied. This is the body of Christ given for you. And this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And now, may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Jesus, bread of life, we have received from your table more than we could ever ask. As you have nourished us in this meal, now strengthen us to love the world with your own life. In your name we pray. Amen. Receive now the Lord's blessing. The blessing of God who provides for us, feeds us, and journeys with us be upon you both now and forever. Amen.
People of St. Timothy, what have we been called to do? Go in peace. Serve the Lord.